Again, thank you very much for giving me uh, this opportunity to talk in front of you today. This is truly a subject that I'm passionate about. Many of the subjects that we're going to talk about this afternoon um, are broached in my book, Shiny Objects, Why We Spend Money We Don't Have in Search of Happiness We Can't Buy. But I do have a title for my talk today. Uh, what would Jesus drive? The ethics of overconsumption. So I thought you, I thought you might like that. Um, it was Socrates, and again, this is this is going to be expanding my boundaries of philosophy and that. So I'm going out on the edge here. Well, it was Socrates who said, uh, "Unexamined life is not worth living." He also had something else to say about happiness. He said that happiness was our kind of our goal of all of our activities. So it was considered to be what's called what Socrates referred to as an unconditional good. It was good in and of itself. Socrates is also one of the first philosophers to say that happiness is obtainable through uh, human effort. And lastly, he said that external things can't in and of themselves bring happiness. It's how we use those external things, those things like money, material possession, things that we're going to talk about today. It's how they're used that what determine whether they bring about happiness or not. They're called conditional goods. Um, I want to ask you a quick question. Can, and this is more of a rhetorical question, because hopefully by the end of my talk we'll be able to make our own decisions about this. Do you feel that um, happiness can be purchased online at the mall or um, from a catalog? Think about that for a second. I think that's the message that we're getting from modern society. And uh, before we go any further, I'd like to share a few stories about people who uh, have kind of wholeheartedly embraced this idea that happiness can be bought online at the mall or from a catalog. What I call Consumers Gone Wild. It's my favorite section of my book were little vignettes talking about consumers who went wild. Let me share a couple of these with you just to kind of set the tone for this idea of happiness can be purchased. Consumers Gone Wild. Um, Let's first talk a little bit about pet spending in the United States. I love pets, and you'll see kind of a reoccurring theme of pets throughout a lot of my research. Anybody want to take a guess to how much money we spent on pets last year? Anybody? Million. Ten billion. Millions? No, billion. <laughs> Millions? Fifty-two billion dollars we spent on pets. And for you mathematically challenged, which would include me, a billion is a thousand million. We spent $52 billion on our pet. And it wasn't just for, you know, hospital visits and spay and neutering, spay and, neutering and things like that. It was for psychoanalysts, treatment for depression, antidepressant <laughs> drugs, cosmetic surgery, tummy tucks, you know, eye tucks, all that kind of stuff. $52 billion. And a little bit more about that, that's $456.69 per household or a cool $133.33 per person in the United States we spent on our pets last year. And, we're, and again, remember, last year wasn't a great year for the economy, so who knows what will happen this year. Um, also, how about Halloween spending? And we'll see the kind of recurrent theme of pets here in my talk today. Um, last year for Halloween, I could talk about Valentine's Day today, but I decided we'd talk about Halloween. Halloween, last year we spent seven billion dollars on Halloween. Candy, costumes, parties, that kind of stuff. But not to leave our pets out, we spent $310 million on pets, costumes for our pets. $310 million. All right, so moving on. You're getting the idea here. We, whether we believe it or not that happiness can be purchased online at the mall or from a catalog, there's a lot of us who are really doing our best to try to prove that truth. Um, now, I'm always treading on sacred ground or kind of slippery or thin ice here when I talk about mother people's grandmothers, but there is a grandmother in Colorado who is the founding member of the National Cookie Cutters Collectors Club. And of course, I'm an advertiser, so I've shortened and sweetened that up to NC4. So she's the, um, she's the founding member of NC4. She has 10,000 cookie cutter collections, cookie cutters in her collection. So much that she doesn't have room to cook or bake in her house because of so many cookie cutters all around the house. So that gives you an idea that we're making our best effort here to find happiness in material possessions. And my uh, last brief example, and I'll have to give credit to my daughter where credit is due for her title, Junk in Your Trunk. Well, that has to do about the storage unit industry. Now, there would have been one investment. That people always ask me, well, what do we do with all this stuff? Well, if it's not under our bed, in our garage, it's in storage units. So if you could have invested in storage units in 1980, I wouldn't be working here. I would, at least I wouldn't have to work here at Baylor because I would have been able to retire. Back in 1984, we had approximately 4,600 storage units in the United States. Last year, we have 
had 46,500 storage units. To give you an idea how much storage unit space that is, every man, woman, and child in the United States could stand shoulder to shoulder and fit under the canopy of the storage unit industry. So we've got a lot of space. So we've got a lot of space. So now here's the real big question of all that, though. Has this, all this spending made us happier? What do you think? Let's look. This is really what prompted me to write my book. And I said, what's wrong with this picture? Let's look. What gross domestic product is, it's just simply really a measure of personal spending. There's a little few other things in there, but the majority of it, personal spending. And gross domestic product, as you can see in the United States, this is based upon a survey called the General Social, Sur Social Survey from the University of Chicago. So thousands and thousands of people every year we've asked them the same questions so we can track changes over the year. Gross domestic product, we see, has one up almost unabated. Well, we know what this was, right? That was the Great Recession of 2008. So you know, there's little drops, and you know, we have to accommodate for those little inevitable two to three recessions we have every 10 years. But by and large, what's happened? We're spending more and more and more. Look at from 1970 to 2011. Well, now let's look at the real kicker here. Let's look at our happiness. What has happened to our happiness during that same time frame? Same people, University of Chicago, General Social Survey results, thousands of people. This is, this is uh, a cumulative of about 50,000 people are interviewed over these years, and what have we found? Our happiness has what we call in the medical business, it has flat line. We're no happier today than we were back in 1970, despite an ever-increasing <coughs> amount of personal expenditure. And I don't want to be depressing, right? I'm always trying to be upbeat and try to you know, give, a, give a hearty message, but not only are we not any happier than we were 40 some years ago? We're even less happy, to be honest with you. These generations today, compared to generations in the past, are more stressed, anxious, and depressed than any previous generations. So it's just not working. We're spending, spending, and spending, but not only are we not getting any happier, we're more stressed out and anxious and depressed than, uh, than we have been in the past. Brought in a little more philosophy here. I know this class, and so I tried to uh, you know, lift up my level of my game here for a little bit. St. Augustine, had, I think this, the visual kind of imagery that this conjures up is just powerful. What does St. Augustine have to say about money and happiness, material possessions and happiness? Well, he had to say, my soul was sick and covered in sores. Just imagine that. Um, and it rubbed up against material things in a desperate attempt to relieve the itching. But since material things have no soul, they cannot be loved. So I thought that was a pretty profound statement about uh, our attempts to uh, achieve happiness through uh, material possessions. Well, the Bible wasn't also silent on all this as well, as you well know. Um, a couple just uh, scriptures, and we could, there's hundreds of them. Most popular topic in the Bible, I think eight to 900 times, is about money, right? So this isn't something that we're struggling with now. is nothing different than what they struggled with thousands of years ago. So when I think about the Bible, and we can, there's something called the prosperity gospel. That I do a lot of research in that area about this idea that, well, I think a lot of you, weren't you asked to read that God's financial plan for all of us? We talked a little bit about the prosperity gospel in there. That's really important, right? I mean, this is what drives our, our behavior and our lifestyle as Christians, and yet... Um, there's a lot of argument, a lot of discussion about what the Bible says about money. I, you know, I come down on one side, but I'm going to let you make up your own mind. Um, the Bible says in a couple of different places, 1 Timothy 6, 10, we know that. What's that? That money, not money, but the love of money is at the root of all kinds of evil, right? The love of money, materials, and that's what my book was all about. How does this love of stuff impact our happiness? Well, it seems pretty clear there that the Bible is saying... It's not a good path to happiness. Um, Matthew talked about uh, do not store up your treasures here on earth with a rust and be stolen. You'll store up your treasures in heaven. And then we also have uh, Matthew 6 that said do not covet your neighbor's what? Your neighbor's house, his maidservant, his male servant, his ox, his um, donkey, and anything else that he has. And so I think the Bible is pretty clear. But there are proponents on the other side that say the Bible tells us, Mark 10, 30, tells us what? That whatever we give to God will be returned to us a hundredfold. That's really all these prosperity gospels, uh, preachers that you see on TV late at night, and you know even some of the mainstream churches, they use that passage. And a couple of Matthew, ask and ye shall be given, right? As kind of 
support for the idea that God wants us to be uh, financially well off. But so I'll let you make up your mind. We can't make that decision here today in 40 minutes, but it's enough and very important that we think about that. All right, so what's so wrong about living a materialistic lifestyle? I mean, one of the big, one of the big hurdles that I've had to overcome with my book is that as Americans, we are so far down the road you know, to a, a materialistic lifestyle that it's really difficult for us to look back and even to envision what it would be like to live a life without material possessions at the at its center, at its core. Um, so what's wrong with um, living a materialistic life? So let's talk about it. First thing is that um, we've done a lot of research in this area, not just me, but hundreds of other people have done research, and the research is pretty clear. People who are more materialistic are less happy, or le less happy with themselves, have less healthy relationships with other people, and are more likely, or less likely, I'm sorry, to get involved in community activities and tie at church. And those are all, and the problem with that is, those are all the things that are really the cornerstones of us being happy individual. How we feel about ourselves, our healthy relationships, that's really what God and Jesus are all about, is healthy relationships. And we don't get involved in the community, and being part of a community is what makes us feel good. We have to be, we're, as humans, we are social animals. We want to be in community with other people. So, we, when you're a materialist, when you're highly materialistic, we all are to one degree or another, you start to see other people as competition. You use other people as a point of comparison rather than in, in uh, fellowship, right? And then we, very simply, if you're a man or a woman, I try to avoid being sexist, um, and you're highly materialistic, materialistic what do you do? You work longer, and when you work longer, you spend less time with your spouse, less time with your children, you're stressed, you're depressed, and that all undermines your happiness. And so, yeah, I really wrote the book because it, you know, everyone can understand when you're a materialist, you know, that's going to wreak havoc on your finances, right? We're going to have credit card debt, and we're going to argue with our spouses, or maybe in your life position, in your life cycle stage, you'll argue with your parents and asking for more money. And it just creates unhappiness, but it wreaks havoc on our finances. But again, what I'm saying here is that how materialistic we are really has an impact far beyond our finance, how we feel about ourselves, our relationships with others, and our involvement in the community. And then I can add to that, of course, we don't want to overlook, and actually, I did my doctor dissertation on ecologically conscious consumer behavior. What types of people are most, are most likely to consider the impact that their consumer behavior has on um, others and on the environment? So we need to look at electronic waste and the impact that our consumer behavior has on, on environmental life. I've got electronic waste, landfills, you know, pollution, ground, air, water pollution, and things like that. So what we're starting to see here is that these behaviors that we think we're making, individual private decisions have a very public impact. And then certainly, it has a negative impact on our finances. All right, so I've been asked today to talk about the ethics of overconsumption. I'm going to talk more about it from an individual perspective, but also we want to look at what do corporations do to encourage us to overconsume, and I'm going to do all that in about 40 minutes, so good luck anyway, so there we go. Um, so why is it so important for us to study our morals and that kind of character that we carry around with it? There's a number of different reasons. One is that morals can guide our lives in the pursuit of noble versus self-interest pursuits. Very important. Morals can inspire us to live lives of meaning. A failure to live up, our, or, uh, our, live up to our morals can be a catalyst for change. So it's important that we examine you know, what we feel is right and wrong and our behavior as it relates to right and wrong. And living by our morals can lead to high self-esteem. Everything comes back to that. When we feel good about ourselves, we're proud of who we are, we do the right thing, we have more healthy relationships, we get more involved in the community. So this all comes back to how do we feel about ourselves? All right, this is an interesting, a great quote by a guy named Richard Will that said, you can't separate consumption from ethics. And here's what he had to say. Consumption is in essence a moral matter, since it's always and inevitably raises issues of fairness, self versus group, interest, and immediate versus delayed gratification. And that's a real powerful statement. And we'll talk about it here. I do a lot of research in the area of self-control, right? And a lot of this comes down to our ability to delay gratification, control ourselves. And that's what immediate versus delayed gratification comes down to. Do we have the ability to control our behavior for the best interest of ourselves and everybody else involved? Um, there's something called negative externality when we make a decision to consume. A lot of times people will say, let's look at cigarettes. And they'll say, hey, I can smoke. What's it to you, right? That's my freedom as an American to smoke or drive a Hummer or other things that might have serious negative externalities. 
A negative externality is when people not involved directly in the exchange are, although, are, are still impacted by that exchange. Let's look at cigarettes. What's wrong with me smoking and you making cigarettes? Why should anyone else have anything to do? What are the negative externalities of cigarette smoking? Anybody? Secondhand smoke. Yeah, secondhand smoke. What else? Lung cancer. Yeah, lung cancer, a higher insurance premiums because people die earlier and are in the hospital more. And we all share the wealth, kind of, so to speak, on that. So, so you understand the concept there of negative externalities. What are seemingly private consumption decisions have very public consequences. So that's cigarettes. <laughs> Certainly with alcohol, we can say that same thing, right? They make alcohol, I'm willing to pay what they charge for alcohol, who else should be concerned? Well, of course, we know, and we didn't, okay, well, we'll get to cell phones in a second. I always like to hold cell phones to the end because we're so, all of us are so invested in cell phones. But with alcohol, of course, there's drunk driving, there's the problems that it causes in relationships. So no doubt, there's a heavy cost to um, our decision to drink alcohol as well. And I know I never, this is never a popular topic to bring up with young people, but I'm going to talk about it. Are there negative externalities to cell phone use? Anybody? I know that's a hard one, right? We're all so invested in uh, cell phones. Yeah, first thing, what about distracted driving, right? To me, if one person in the United States dies because someone's on the cell phone, that's one person too much, right? That's too high of a cost for the rest of us to have the right to talk on our, talk on our phones while we're driving. Um, so yeah, that's a big one. That's a big externality. Anything else? Any other, it's a, it's a great little statistic on the front cover of my book about cell phones. We throw away a hundred, get this, in the United States, we throw away 140 million cell phones a year. And so that's a negative externality. What happens to those cell phones? Anybody? Yeah, they get into landfills. I was hoping someone would say they're recycled. Because that's what the industry wants us to believe. That, oh, we get to recycle and put them back, it's all kind of neat and no one's the worst for it. Well, the truth of the matter, we can't talk a lot about this today, but the truth of the matter is a lot of these cell phones end up in China and in India, in towns. Literally, you can drive into towns in rural China and India, and there will be computers and laptops and cell phones, maybe even iPads pretty soon, piled up along the roadway. This is the recycling program. And then people pay, they pay people 10, 15, 20 cents an hour to pick through and grab whatever recycled materials there are, and the rest of the toxins leach into the ground and people die from terrible deformity because of it. So that's the truth behind cell phones. And so there's a truly negative externality, to even something as innocent as cell phones. All right. And certainly, our decisions uh, as consumers impact the natural environment. I love what I call the camper's backcountry ethic for any of you that you like to go out, outdoors. Leave a campsite as you found it. I can go you one better. My grandmother used to say, and maybe your grandmothers did as well, when you leave a room it should be cleaner than when you arrived. That's going one step better. And so the idea here is that our behavior as consumers, obviously, with the cell phone example, obviously our behavior as consumers impacts the natural environment. Here's just a little, little formula that I thought you'd find interesting. Our environmental impact is based upon how big our population is. And think about it. America, United States, what's the population of the U.S.? 300. Yeah, 300 million, you know, give or take. Give or take a million, right? That's of about a world population of how big? About 7 billion, right? Maybe 8 billion. Did it reach 8 billion? So the idea is we're still a very small part of the world's population overall. But it's the next component of this uh, equation of the natural or environmental impact where we pick up the pace, which is affluence, our per capita consumption. We are what we call, or what I call, uber consumers, right? We are leading the vanguard to, uh, of the cultural consumption, of cult the consumption of culture. So we're at the vanguard. And so even though we have less population and we use fairly efficient technology, we have such high impact on the environment as Americans because we just consume so much. As you might guess, we consume on average about four times more energy than a typical uh, citizen of the world. Four times. So we're uber consumers. Um, and our behavior as consumers emanates from our life goals. And our life goals are kind of centered around what we're now living in and have been living in for the last 40 years called a consu consu culture of consumption. Um, let's look at the two basic categories 
of life goals. One are extrinsic goals, and these are interesting. We all have these types of goals. Financial success, that kind of goes hand in hand with materialism, right? We all want to be wealthy, um, status or social recognition, and even physical attractiveness. So think about it. We want to be wealthy, we want to have powerful, we want to be powerful and have a high status in our community. We even want to look good, right? You know, that's why we you know, you know, put on makeup and wear um, sunglasses and things like that. These are all what we call extrinsic goals. And I'll tell you the difference between extrinsic and intrinsic in a second. And look at intrinsic goals. Intrinsic goals are things like we want to feel better about it. We want to grow as human beings, right? So self-acceptance, self-esteem. Um, affiliation, relationships, right? Our, our um, goals here are to have healthy relationships. And then also community involvement. These are intrinsic goals. Now what's the difference? You, I think you could think about it for a second, you could already pick up on the difference. The difference really is this, and why extrinsic goals undermine our well-being when intrinsic goals help us feel better about who we are, is because extrinsic goals are dependent, we call it contingent upon the approval of other people. How much money we have, there's always somebody who has, some, has more, and we're buying that for social, we're, 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 try, we're trying to achieve that for social recognition, social status. And so it's always contingent upon other people, always competing with other people, and there's always going to be people with more than we have. Um, my best example of that, I was getting interviewed on, um, oh, I don't know, public radio. And they were talking about you know this idea. Well, why doesn't you know being materialistic and you know going after goods and money uh, make us feel good? And one of the reasons again is because there's always going to be something or somebody with more than we have. And I use the example of Shaquille O'Neal. My house is probably like a lot of people's house you know, in the two, three thousand square foot range. Well, that's not bad. And there are people in our neighborhood with bigger houses. But the problem is there's always going to be someone with a bigger and a better house. Anyone want to guess how big Shaquille O'Neal's house is? And you know Shaquille O'Neal, the basketball player, seventy-two thousand square feet. You know we're never going to we're, we're just never going to be able to measure up, right? There's always going to be some. So we're always, no matter how much we buy, we call, we call this the treadmill of consumption. We keep moving and moving. We only speed up the treadmill. We never get any closer to being happy. Um, intrinsic goals are ones that are inherent in culture bandwagon. Well, what and how did and college freshmen have shown that? particularly well. Look at these life goals of entering. It's called the College Freshman Survey by University of US, UCLA. And they do about 40, they interview about 40,000 entering college freshmen every year. And look what's happened over the years. Um, and they do a lot of different life goals. But I'm just going to pick out two for our purposes today. One is developing a meaningful philosophy on life. And the other is being very well off financially. This is the 1960s to 2010 because they do it every other year. And what's happened? This life goal of being very well off financially, as you can see, has just you know, kind of peaked. I don't know if I can get much higher. And so it's really remained high. But look at this life goal of developing a meaningful philosophy on life. It's really changed. You know, how we look at money and this consumer culture that you've grown up in has significantly changed how we look at the world. Um, I like to keep things simple. And I try to think about, you know, what ethic can I use to guide my behavior? And I always come back to the golden rule, right? You know, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And there's a golden rule to, found, you know, to be found in the secular world. And look at the one from the New Testament and the Old Testament. And then we can even find in the words of uh, Muhammad, golden rules. And that's an easy kind of rule for us to use when we, when we uh, decide on how to live our lives. I've got a good test for you, though. This is what I call the golden rule acid test. Let's take this, and you don't have to tell me your answer, but let's see what kind of answer you'd give to this question. The golden rule acid test. Is it morally just and fair to be free to have plenty to eat, nice clothes, luxuries, time and money for fun, TV and comforts, while others in the world are starving, uneducated, and in poor health? Oof. That knocked the wind out of me. Right? I mean, that is, that's one for you to really think about. And um, a guy, a friend called, a psychologist called Clayton Tucker Ladd um, gives this question, asks this question of his students, and you'd be surprised by the results. A lot of them, you know, can, you know, rationalize why, but a lot of them said yes. And so again, that's really the acid test, and the real litmus test for us as consumers is, you know, is it okay? And boy, I get a lot of pushback when I talk about this, you know, when you start, especially with all the things going on with the election year and things like that. That's a real acid test. Now I'd like to shift gears for a second and blame those dirty little marketers for why we spend so much money. The $64,000 question here is, 
You know, again, I'm kind of, no, man, I don't defend any. You can ask my students. I never defend marketing. I kind of let the cards or the chips fall as they may. But the $64,000 question is, does marketing, all this advertising and promotions and billboards and ads in the um, uh, movie theater and ads in the urinals, I mean, there's ads everywhere, right? We've got t-shirts with brands on them and things like that. Does that create, does that make us consume more? Does that create needs or does, it, or does marketing simply meet needs? And of course, as you could imagine, just like the prosperity gospel, there's two very divergent camps as to whether marketing meets or creates needs. Now, you think, of course, as a marketing professor, I'd be the first to say, oh, no, it just meets needs. You know, there's no way we create needs. Well, let's just see. Let's look at both sides of that coin. Um, the arguments of that marketing meets needs, not creates needs, are these. There's a very simple concept that we use called the marketing concept. And it's very sim simply put, it means that we have to, for a product to be successful, we have to identify a real need and then produce a product or service to meet that need. And so, really, it adds up with this last bullet point here. It's just too expensive to create needs. It's much, much, and we're very good at determining what your real needs are with all the research we have. We have depth interviews, we have focus groups, we have all different ways of kind of finding out true needs that you have. It's just too expensive for marketers to try to create a need that doesn't already exist. But now, there's arguments on both sides of this, I understand. Um, and kind of a scary idea here is with this idea that marketing meets needs but doesn't create needs is this idea that marketing merely reflects society. And maybe we are just a little bit, uh, you know, haven't kind of raised up to that moral level that we'd like to be. And maybe we are just a little bit crass and materialistic, right? And marketing just merely reflects that. That's a tough one, right? Um, and lastly, and we could talk about this, of course, as you could imagine, all day. What about Moses and Lakshmi? Does anyone know who Lakshmi is? I bet you somebody does. Goddess of wealth. Goddess, the Hindu goddess of wealth and prosperity. And why I bring her up, and I did, I did a particular blog, blog about her, because she certainly relates to the prosperity gospel. Hindus would pray to Lakshmi to, you know, to, to bless them financially. All right? And, but the thing, why I brought her up is because... That's been going on for thousands of years, long before any marketing efforts that you would think of. You know, all the marketing efforts and the advertising we see on our cell phones and on the internet and TV, radio. Forget it. We were already praying to the gods for financial remuneration, for financial blessing, thousands of years before any of this marketing machine started up. That tells you something, and I talk about that in my book, that maybe there's a little bit more to this genetic argument to our materialistic behaviors as human beings. And then certainly, we can look at Moses, right? Comes down the, from the mountain, and there they are making a golden calf, for goodness sakes. The Ten Commandments, thou shalt not, you know, covet our, um, our neighbor's uh, house and belongings. I mean, you know, so we were already materialistic long before any true marketing efforts uh, began. All right, well, let's look at the other side of the coin. You know, they're kind of a little more of the cynical side of the coin. That's those darn marketers. They make us buy stuff that we don't want, right? I think, I think a lot of you, if we took a vote right now, I'm guessing where, which side you might vote on. But let's talk for a second about marketing creates needs. You know, that if it wasn't for all this advertising, if it wasn't for all this marketing, you know, all this stuff on TV and all the stuff I have to see and be exposed to, the pop-ups, the pop-unders, the pop-overs, right, when I'm on the Internet, if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't want anything, right? I'd be a simple, a simple agrarian lifestyle, right? Well, but, yeah, that might be true. There might be some argument to that. Um, what about the research we've done about TV watching and consumption? And you know where I'm going with this, right? The, we found that the more TV people watch, the more they consume. Surprise, surprise, right? Would you love this story? And certainly when it's become parents, you're like that. Children who watch more TV argue, throw more temper tantrums, and uh, make more product requests of their parents. So there's something there. You know, TV and other marketing efforts are fanning these flames of consumerism. Um, well, what about, though, Chia Pets, Pet Rocks, Snuggies? Anyone have a Snuggie? I got a Snuggie for Christmas. I should admit that, but uh, Snuggies. Or even cell phones? We, we, surely we don't need Chia Pets. Now, I know we can make a good argument for selling. You know what a Chia Pet was? It's a little ceramic, like, donkeys or cats, and they were kind of clay. You'd put in the, you'd put in the dirt, and you'd pour a little water in it, and it kind of sprout out, or the sprouts would uh, shoot up and things like that. Clearly, surely we do not need Chia Pets. Pet rocks? 
the 1970s, people used to get rocks, sometimes they'd be painted, and you'd just put that on the and you go, what the heck is going on? But what you, can't, what you can't see here, though, is I've got Maslow's hierarchy of needs up here. Everyone ever heard of Maslow, Abraham Maslow? And that's the idea that we, don't, we, we first have to settle, or we have to satisfy our most basic needs for food, shelter, and clothing. And then after that, we move on to needs for love and self-acceptance and things like that. And then hopefully we someday reach uh, self-actualization. But think about our behavior as consumers in the 21st century. It's all about discretionary income. Most of it, you know, not everybody, I realize there's changing demographics in the world today, and particularly in the United States. But most of us here at Baylor have our basics of food, shelter, and clothing taken care of. And so they no longer become motivators, according to Abraham Maslow. Now we go on to things like self-esteem or group and social acceptance and, and love. And that's a very, those are very different motivators. So when someone says, clearly, Roberts, you just told us with the marketing concept that if a product doesn't meet a real need, it can't be successful. And then you tell me about the Chia Pet, how successful that's been year after year. Well, the secret to the Chia Pet is it's not fulfilling some basic need we have for food, shelter, and clothing, but what it's doing is um, um, fulfilling a basic need to get cheap presents. I don't have to work very hard to give to an aunt who I never see. Right? You know, it does. And so there's a need there. It's not the basic need of food, shelter, and clothing, but that's a real need once we've satisfy those lower level needs for food, shelter, and clothing. And certainly, there's good evidence that as we spend more and more and more money on marketing and advertising, we spent, remember, a billion is a thousand million? Madison Avenue spent $132 billion last year trying to convince us that happiness could be uh, purchased on the mall, at the mall, online, or from a catalog. So there's a lot of efforts to get us to spend more money, and it appears to be working. Our gross domestic products that you saw on that earlier slide that we had has been going up and up and up with slight breaks for uh, major recessions. All right, now I want to talk real briefly about why do we continue to keep spending all the time? I mean, you know, I know when you, I'm sure we could all come up with our own examples of we just thought, just get that dress, that pair of shoes, or that new electronic gizmo, and we'll be happy, right? And then it'll be done all over, and our search will be over. But we continue to spend and spend and spent. And one of my good friends, April Lane Benson, who's a psychiatrist in New York, said, and it was, I think it was quoted on my book, so I use it, I attribute it to her, was that, how can we ever get enough of something that we don't need? I thought that was pretty profound. But, as marketers, I'm not leaving marketers entirely off the hook today, um, I call this, in chapter 11 of my book, I talk about something called Weapons of Mass Consumption. I love that title, and I, I don't think I even came up with it, my agent came up with it. But the idea there was, we're a pretty tricky lot. We know the kind of things that we can do. Some of them are just, we're going to force your hand to get you to keep coming back to the cash register. Let's look for just for a few minutes about some of the things that we do, these weapons of mass consumption. Um, has anyone ever heard of planned obsolescence? Where products are, we, they're called designed for the dump, planned to fail. We all have those, right? Where replacing the battery costs more than buying a new one. I got some great stories in my book about, you know, they come in and they say, well, your stove doesn't work. It'll cost $450 to replace it and get a new one for $600 and you had it for 10 years. You ever try to fix a TV? Forget it. We just throw it out and buy a new one. That's one way that us marketers get you coming back to the cash register, by planned obsolescence. It's not by accident. I've got a great story in the book, but it really is almost only relevant to people of my age. But do you know when I say a blow dryer or a blow comb what I'm talking about? It's like, a, it's like a kind of electronic device that had a comb on it. It would blow hot air and you'd comb your hair. No? I know. See, I always tell my students, I always think I'm going to get a big, oh, yeah, but no. No one but my age or older remembers that. Well, anyways, I remember, seriously, for tw 10 years, 15 years, fighting the struggle of this blow dryer would work and work and work. But what would happen? The little comb attachments, the wide tooth, the narrow tooth, the brush, would always break. And then I'd try to find a way to replace them. But of course, those were never to be had, and so what did I end up doing? Having to buy a whole new one. So I think we can all think of plenty of examples in our life where we have had to buy new rather than used, or rather than keep what we have, because it's too expensive to replace, particularly with our love of electronics. You know, iPhones now, you drop them in the water, you go get a new one, even though I see a shop there on Valley Mills is attempting to be the iPhone doctor. But it doesn't work, and it's usually probably more expensive than just getting a new one. So that's planned obsolescence. Ladies, what about perceived obsolescence? That's so last year. 
I'm thinking of the ladies, but men too, right? Young men spend more on clothing than young women. Can you believe that? But yeah, every year, what is it? Skirts are high, skirts are low, skirts are in between. I've got two daughters and a wife, right? I'm you know, inundated with this fashion cycle. I live by the fashion cycle. Boots this year, not next year, you know, high boots, low boots, high heels, low heel, that kind of stuff. It changes all the time. You know who really began that in earnest? The automobile industry. General Motors in about the 1920s introduced the annual style change, and it was off to the races. Henry Ford, the owner of Ford um, Motor Company, didn't like it. His, he was all about, you know, I'll give you a car, and I'll give it to you cheap, and everyone can afford to drive a car. But ultimately, he had to give in because people wanted different colors, different makes, different models every year. He ultimately had to give up and start making or start offering annual style changes as well. So, yeah, perceived obsolescence. No, those are last year's boots, right? Or neon, that's, you know, that's last year. But not even quite yet, right? I know the neon is kind of having the, the hip fashion trend right now. But guess what? Whether you believe me or not, next year you can look at that. What are we thinking? Bright yellow you know, uniforms for our men? <laughs> orange tennis? Okay, you got me on that one. Um, what about product placements? One of my favorite areas of advertising and promotions are product placements. Well, what's happened? You know, again, we're a pretty smart lot, despite the uh, stereotypical marketing kind of <coughs> profile. We're a pretty smart lot, and we figured out that there's just so many commercial, you know, at the end, of what do we do? The commercials come out, we go, you know, make a phone call, get something to eat, use the bathroom, and we miss them anyways, right? Well, we're smarter than that. And so one thing that we've done is we started to hide products in movies and television shows, even in books, even on the internet and things like that. We've inserted our product in there to avoid the clutter that comes from just traditional advertising. Can anyone think of a product placement that they've seen in a movie or on a television show? How so? Oh, you see the Apple design all the time. And it's not by chance. So when you see somebody flip back on that, I noticed this last night, someone flip back on the bed and you see that little Apple there? That wasn't by accident. That was a paid product placement. To give you a little fact, my favorite, one of my favorite movies, I should say my favorite movie, that could, uh, could undermine my credibility altogether here, um, whatever there is of my credibility here. Um, Paul Blart, Mall Cop. And it's, uh, I knew it, I knew it. I love that show, saw it twice. I love the guy with you know, the low blood sugars and fall down before the finish line so you can never become a police officer. 49 product placements in that movie. They made so much money selling product placements to company. They made as much money doing that than they did from generating revenue from the movie. How about, how many people watch American Idol? Come on, you can admit it. American Idol? No? You must not be the, I think it is skewing older now. So it is really old. Guess what? American Idol makes more money, makes more money off product <coughs> placements than they do advertising. And who, do they, who are some of their big ones? Verizon, Ford, Coca-Cola. They make a ton. They make actually more money off product placements now than they do traditional advertising. Wouldn't they make a lot off traditional advertising? Anybody? What's a 30-second spot on American Idol go for? I'm not talking to marketing students here, so I'll just give you an idea. Give you a guess. I'll give you a chance to make a guess. 30 seconds to tell somebody what you've got. I wouldn't want that kind of pressure. Not for that price. $500,000. About five hundred twelve thousand dollars for a thirty-second spot, uh, but again, you're talking to a lot of people, right? It's one of the number one rated shows. All right, so that's product placement, and here is really where we push the ethical limits of marketing efforts. Word of mouth. Does anyone know what the fourth wall is? Have you ever heard of that statement? It's an actor statement. I never heard about it until I wrote, read, wrote my book and was reading about it. It's that idea that when someone's acting, if they then go talk to the audience, they've broken that fourth wall. Well, what I mean by that in marketing is we have now went to orchestrated word of mouth campaign to encourage people to buy our product. We have hired Procter & Gamble, other companies that have hired mothers, daughters, and just everyday Joes and Jills to sell their products. And so what's so bad about this is that now we don't know when we're being sold. A lot of things, and you know, oh, I love this product online, and you should buy it, and you know, you know what? That's probably not coming from me and you. That's probably coming from a paid product endorser. You're at, okay, that's a stretch here at Baylor, but you're at a bar, and someone says, you really need to try that Red Bull and uh, rum combination or something. Like that. that guy might be there, paid by Red Bull, to go out there and promote Red Bull. And so you take that as a, you know, oh, this is something good, and we believe other people. Most of our decisions we make as consumers come from information we get from other people more than we do from advertising. What happens when you break that fourth wall? 
where we can't even trust human relationships anymore because they've been co-opted by the marketing machine. All right, so we've, we're tricky. We know what's going on here, and a lot of that, we're having to get more creative in how we encourage you to buy our product. So in closing, consumption is a moral matter. How we spend our money is not entirely our own business. Think about negative externalities, right? As individuals, however, though, we can make a difference. And so I just want to leave you with a couple things here. Um, one is, how can we change the world? I also say change the world beginning with you. One thing that we can do is we can learn to distinguish between needs and wants. And I'll make it easy for you. Pretty much everything we buy are wants. You know, outside of some very basic clothing, and food and a roof over our head, and it doesn't have to be a 4,000 or 72,000 square foot roof, um, is discretionary spending. So, you know, think for a while about, do I really need this? Do I want it? What purpose is there? And maybe just really think about the opportunity costs. What are the opportunity costs, you know, to, from me buying this product? And who might be going without? And what kind of impact might it have on the environment? What kind of impact might it have people who are not involved in the exchange, right? Remember those? negative externalities. So that's something we have to struggle with, but it's worth thinking about. Then I call them the three R's of socially responsible living or consumer behavior is reduce, reuse, and recycle. And here, recycling is the last alternative that I want you to choose. I want you to either reduce or reuse because recycling takes, first thing, it takes up a lot more energy than reducing or reusing, and it doesn't cut down on your spending all, right? You know, you recycle yourself, well that's great, but you're still buying another one, right? When you reduce or reuse, you're becoming a more, you have more money available and you're becoming a more responsible consumer. Um, clarify what's really important to you. I call it um, the deathbed test, or sometimes I've had, this maybe sounds sick almost, but I've had my students write their obituary. Have you ever done that? Where someone's asked you to write your obituary? Okay, I got some people shaking their head. And you have to write your you know, obituary as to, how would you, know, you want your obituary to read? And of course, the first thing the students always say, well, he lived a long life, right? Okay, after that, after he lived a long life, what do you want your obituary to say? And you know, it's usually about that he gave back to the community, he was a loving parent, you know, had loving, adoring children and grandchildren and all that kind of stuff. Not that they drove great cars and was you know, just getting ready for the next big acquisition <laughs> when he or she passed away. So that's the old, write your obituary. The deathbed test is similar to that. And it's my saying, when I think about the deathbed test, I always say, no one on their deathbed ever wished they spent more time at work. No one on their deathbed ever wished they spent more time at work. So deathbed test, write your own obituary, save your money. And there's something liberating, I mean, there's something very liberating, and we call it financial peace, about saving your money, having control over money. My favorite saying, and my wife, to, has, it bothers her because every time I get up in church and do the prayer, I always talk about, Lord, help us to make money. Our money is a poor master, but a good servant. She said, I've said that so many times that she wants me to you know, move on to new material. But the idea there is, yeah, when you have mastery over your money, it's a, it's a wonderfully liberating and that doesn't mean, my book doesn't at all, and I don't encourage at all that we all shave our heads and move to a kibbutz. But I say we need to have a moderate approach to how we handle money and material possession. Not that we don't have to spend, because I'll tell you the truth, our research tells us that spendthrifts, you know, people who are very materialistic, aren't very happy, but guess what? Misers aren't either. Miserly is misery, we say in research. That, you know, people who are really cheap aren't happy as well. It's all about finding that kind of middle ground there. Um, shop responsibly, meaning you can buy from companies that have good uh, records, maybe don't have, um, uh, like the SIN stocks, don't have, uh, nuke, don't, aren't involved in nuclear weapons, pornography, alcohol, cigarettes, that kind of stuff. There are guides that can help us be more socially responsible investors and consumers. And this idea, and it all kind of undergirded by this idea of learning and practicing the art of self-control. Again, I mean, uh, a guy once said years ago, I'm indeed a king because I rule myself. That's particularly powerful, right? So it's a lost art. We have to learn to rein back in our desires. And when we do, we become free. We become much more liberated. So be a voice for change. It's going to be a little bit like a salmon swimming upstream, right? Most of your friends, you know, I mean, me included, you know, and my daughters even, we have to fight this even in our house because they live in a world that I do and haven't had the opportunity to kind of reflect and think about it like I have. And so, yeah, it's hard to do this when our friends are spending and we've been told. Look at that. I always get out. I don't want to get into politics at all. But what, what happened after 9-11? What did, what did George Bush tell us to do? And I like George Bush just fine. So what did he tell us to do? 
Go out and spend money. We can't let them beat us, right? We got to show them that we're still the consumers that we've always been. Obama said the same thing in 2008. Go out and spend money. And again, I was in an interview with NPR, and they said, "Well, you're telling us, Roberts. You're telling us. Well, they were nice with that, but they said uh, you're telling us that we shouldn't spend money. What's that going to do to the economy? It's going to slow down, and people are going to lose their jobs. And oh my God, it's going to be Armageddon, right? Well, the idea is first. Would you want to take financial advice from anybody, including the government, who's more than a trillion dollars in debt? I made the analogy on NPR that, that um, having consumers spend to prop up the economy is akin to a mother line eating her cubs to survive. It's just not good practice, right? And then if you want my answer, well, what can we do for our economy to continue to grow when we're taking a step back? We're talking about exports. We've got to grow our economy outside the United States because it's not going to work. We cannot continue to spend like we do and you know forever and uh, grow our economy. My favorite philosophy, um, favorite uh, quote in that area is by a guy named Edward Abbey. He said, "Growth for the sake of growth. Think of our economy. Growth for the sake of growth is the philosophy of the cancer cell." Well, that was pretty appropriate when it comes to spending in our in our economic policy. All right, let me close with a quote from who else? But um, Albert Einstein, who said, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. Thank you for your time.